actually read the book in therapy now 15 years ago when I was a medical student. When I was interested, started to have interest in sexual diversity, gender diversity. And I cannot imagine at all that I'll be speaking at the conference here 15 years later. But from the alternative side of things. Um, so as Dominic um, said, this is a sort of like new topic. It's actually, it's not brand new, but um, it's uh, stimulated by lots of observations from clinicians particularly and many case reports in the past that uh, the two conditions or two um, spectrums of individual differences may have something uh, in relation. And then there are a few, uh, not many, but a few studies coming up about in the past five years that start to look at these issues more systematically. So what I'm going to do today is to uh, do a, a quick summary of these new um, empirical findings, and probably we can discuss a bit about what would be the implications from there, and have some uh, interactions and discussions on the topic. Um, so, as we all know that um, autism is actually a spectrum condition, it's representing a sort of like extreme of individual differences. It has been recognized as being probably more common in boys than in girls, in men than in women, in terms of biological sex. Uh, in a ratio in the past, about four to five to one, but nowadays it's more recognized that we might be missing recognizing higher functioning females on the spectrum. So uh, the latest studies, the epidemiological studies about the prevalence rate in terms of male female ratio is roughly about two to three to one. Um, it's characterized by a range of behavior, as, as we all know that it, these <coughs> conditions are defined by behaviors. So some of the behaviors are related to uh, how people interact with each other socially. Some of the behaviors are related to how people communicate with each other uh, using verbal or nonverbal uh, ways. And some of them are related to uh, interest, uh, particular interest or special interest or behavior characteristics of an individual. And some of them are related to co cognitive aspects of the individual. Um, so to summarize, uh, from probably 1980s up to um, last year, uh, people usually talk about the triad of autism, which means that when we define autism, we're trying to, to um, define by three characteristics. One is a deficit or impairment in terms of medical literature um, on social interaction or social reciprocity. And the second is about communication and also about the development of language and speech. And the third part is mainly about um, behavior characteristics, which is repetitive and restricted behavior or interest. And people start to um, change the conceptualization. Um, actually, one example here is from the DSM-5 published last year, which goes back to actually what Leo Cannon, the first case report series uh, of autism, that it's, autism should probably be conceptualized by um, two dimensions of characteristics. One is social communication, because most of the communication aspects are related to social interaction, so they cannot really be separated from each other. And the second is still the res restricted and fixa fixated interest and behaviors. And they sort of like pull out language development as a separate um, dimension. So if one gets autism, or gets being diagnosed with autism, but also getting uh, delayed language onset, he or she will actually get two labels, one is autism spectrum disorder, one is implied, and the other is late language onset uh, by the SM5 as well. And uh, I, don't, I don't want to go into details of this, because I know most of us should be very familiar with that, but I just want to say that um, these are the DSM-5 criteria, and as you can see that when people define autism, they mention about, this is criteria A, which is a social communication aspect, they mention about social emotional reciprocity, and they also mentioned about nonverbal communication, and then they mentioned about developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. And uh, the reason I put up here, put up the thing here, is that to mention there's nothing related to <coughs> gender or sexuality specifically in the behavior criteria. And this is a, the second domain, which is restricted, restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, and activities. And they're more heterogeneous, because as you can see, Point one, two, three, four refers to four different um, um, aspects of behavioral characteristics. So first about stereotype repetitive movements and speech. 
and second is about the routine bits, uh, insistence on sameness, inflexibility, um, and third is about the high intensity of restricted fixated interests. And the fourth, which is, which is sort of like new to the criteria but not new to the field as a whole, is uh, uh, hyper or hyper reactivity to sensor inputs or an unusual interest to sensory aspect of things. These are just the um, behaviors characteristic of it. Um, and it, there's lots of like verbals here, but mm -hmm. I want to point it out here is that in the idea of these American psychiatrists, that although they use the term ASD as an umbrella term, they still recognize that it's a heterogeneous condition. So they propose it can be specified by other factors, for example, with or without accompanying intellectual issues or uh, language impairment, and also associated with other known medical or neurodevelopmental mental behavioral conditions. Um, I don't really need to talk about this slide in this audience. I just want to quickly mention that we, have to, we, we usually use the term gender variant uh, in the medical literature, especially in, again, the American, in the American um, uh, psychiatric diagnostic criteria. They shifted from the term gender identity disorder in the war back in, and also transsexualism back in 30 years ago, now towards the term gender dysphoria. Uh, so taking out the term disorder. And the idea of gender variant uh, and gender nonconformity implies a wide spectrum of one's identity and gender expression. Uh, and sometimes it includes transgenderism, and transgender individuals or transsexual individuals. Uh, in the medical literature, there is some kind of um, prevalence estimate to this. So in the very uh, narrowed gender identity disorder, especially estimated from the medical literature, is actually about 1 in uh, 10,000 or even more, 20,000, 30,000. But for the broader gender dysphoria or gender variant, usually measured by questionnaires, uh, usually asking, are, do you have the wish to become the opposite sex, something like that. And um, if one said, I frequently have that, uh, the, the, the sort of like prevalence rate of that actually raises up to about roughly about 1%. So for males it forms 7 to 1.9%, for female from 9 to 7.3%, from different literatures, from like Coolidge, uh, it's from American um, population, and the second one from a Dutch population, all child adolescent, and the third one from a, from Taiwanese population that I did, um, it's in young adults. So it's all surrounding around this like 100%. Sorry, one uh, percent range. Um, for autism, I forgot to mention that the prevalence um, nowadays estimated is also about one in hundred. So the two conditions or two individual differences spectrums are actually having uh, sort of like a similar similar prevalence rate. If you take into if you if you define them by the broader uh, conceptualization of a spectrum. Um, I don't really need to mention this, but this is the new DSM-5 criteria for children. Um, and as you can see, they, 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 they emphasize the marked so-called incongruence between one's experience of expressed gender and assigned gender, which is a term used. Uh, and they, they define this by a range of behaviors. This could be, uh, for children, it could be the way one dresses, the way one plays, the way one chooses their toys, the way one chooses their playmates, or uh, how they view their uh, physical appearances, their sexual anatomy, and so on. And also, the new DSM-5 has an idea about uh, we should probably take into account how um, gender variant uh, presents in different age groups. For example, in adolescent and adults, they create a new sets of criteria, and also it's mainly about how one expresses um, the feelings and uh, the incongruence between one's experience, expressed gender and assigned or birth or natal, natal sex. Right, so what, what is actually the cross road? Um, there are two lines of empirical literature showing associations between the two spectrums. There might be increased rates of autism spectrum condition in gender variant. And the other line is there might be increased rate of gender variance in autism spectrum condition. Uh, to be honest, 
there are only a few empirical studies. There are some case reports. There's only, there are only four studies for the first part. There are only two studies for the second part. So nothing's for sure yet. There are just some initial um, numbers coming out. So let's take a look at the first aspects uh, about the prevalence or the <coughs> rates of autistic um, trace diagnosis in gender dysphoria. The, way, the, the reason I use gender dysphoria follow up is because uh, for these studies they usually use um, uh, populations recruited from, from clinics. So they usually have it uh, in relation as having a gender identity disorder diagnosis or gender dysphoria. <coughs> so it's not quote the term at this stage. This is the first study published um, four years ago already uh, from the largest uh, Dutch um, gender identity clinic at the Free University of Amsterdam. Um, they recruited over 100 males and females, birth males and females, uh, child adolescent populations. And as you can see that in the children population, when they do a formal clinical diagnosis for autism spectrum disorder, using a, a, a gold standard instrument called the DISC code, which is created by Lorna Wing and Judy Gold here in the UK. When they use this very, sort of like very uh, standard, basically stringent diagnostic tool, they found that in, the, in all the children having a gender identity issue, <coughs> there are 6.4% 4, 6 of them have a clinical diagnosis of ASD. And what is interesting is that for those uh, having a DSM-4 GID diagnosis, there's 1.9% of them having ASD. But for those in DSM-4 GID NOS, which means having gender dysphoric issues, having gender variant, but not meeting the criteria given by the DSM-4, it's actually 13% of them having ASD, a clinical diagnosis of ASD. <coughs> and what is interesting here is that if the, the gender dysphoric uh, presentations tend to alleviate with age, at one year follow up in these individuals. So six out of them, out of the seven, had uh, decreased genetic dysphoric um, presentations. For the adolescent population, the rate is actually the highest, about 9.4%. Uh, and also, it's, a, it's the same idea that in those with GID, 6.5% uh, having clinical ASD. In those with GID and OS, it's actually 37.5% of them having ASD. <coughs> And not surprisingly, according to the broader gender dysphoria literature, um, the presentation or the so-called uh, intensity of gender dysphoria tends to persist in this, in this age group. Um, and what is also interesting is that the majority of gender dysphoric adolescents with ASD were sexually attracted to the opposite natal sex. So uh, from, from the literature, it seems to be um, somewhat different from a broad, the, the broader gender dysphoric um, population that um, the, the broader might be attracted to the, the same natal sex. So this is one one um, specific observation from the authors in this in this clinical data. Um, so this is actually the first um, empirical and formal study examining the prevalence rate of uh, autism spectrum disorder from a gender identity clinic, and unfortunately, it's still it's still the only study that examines. Um, uh, the formal diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder by um, a certain gold standard criteria. But from other studies, it has been shown that if we do not necessarily uh, define autism by a clinical diagnostic criteria, but we look at the traits or individual differences in relation to autism, so that's so-called autism trait, or autistic traits, or autistic-like traits, then there are actually a few studies um, also giving similar uh, information. This is one study conducted here in the UK, um, recruited individuals, um, basically gender variant individuals online or via the Charing Cross Gender Identity Clinic. And they finally recruited adult individuals, uh, male to female um, 198 and female to male 61. Uh, they measure, they actually ask the participants to, to uh, fill in a questionnaire which is called autism spectrum quotient. Um, it's a measurement about individual differences uh, on the autism spectrum. A range of characteristics including social communication and uh, interest and attention to detail and so on. 
Um, as you can see from the right bar, it's a comparison group of people with autism spectral conditions. And not surprisingly, um, for both males, which is genetic males, which is a black bar, and um, genetic females, which is a white bar, they all show quite a high level, in average, high level of autism spectrum quotient score. For a control group, so people without autism spectral condition, or without gender dysphoria, uh, they showed um, kind of like a normal range or uh, average range in, the, in, uh, in, uh, in comparison to the general population in the, in, the, in the average about between 15 to 20 of the score for male, both males and females. And biological males having a higher score compared to biological females. And what the study found is that for the, they call it transsexual group, but basically just barrier group, for the female to male uh, individuals, they actually scored uh, high, high, significantly higher than controls on the AQ score, but not to the extent of individuals on the spectrum. So that's the Y bar here. Um, but for the male female um, individuals, there isn't an increased autistic trait in this study. So suggesting that at least for the female to male um, adults, they in average scored a higher on the autism spectrum quotient, but that's not observed in the other um, gender variant for biological males. Uh, but there is uh, another study, also here conducted in London, um, showing slightly different results. Uh, the commonality between this and the previous one is that um, they also found there's higher rate of individuals um, in the male to female or female to male um, gender variant individuals having a higher autism spectrum quotient. And for those scored above a screening cutoff on the, on, on the score, 32, uh, the preference rate is about 5.5, which means that if we say, define these individuals as having a clinically significant autism um, trait, then the preference rate of that is actually higher than the general population rate, which is about 1%. Um, and also, what they found is that for all these individuals who scored above the cutoff, they're all, to some extent, sexually attracted to the opposite natal sex, so which is a similar finding to the previous Dutch studies on adolescent uh, gender dysphoria. Um, but what's, what's in contrast in this study to the previous one is that they found a similar, similar high uh, autism spectrum quotient score in the male to female and female to male individuals. So that's different from the earlier, the earlier study, but probably the larger study. The last um, study is conducted in the Toronto Clinic, which is another, probably the, la the largest one um, in Canada and North America. Um, they chart reviewed their gender referred children. So again, it's a clinic sample, children being brought to the gender identity clinic at Toronto. Um, they try to identify if there is increased um, traits related to autism in individuals with gender dysphoria. Um, uh, the tool they use is still one item, so that's uh, a tool called uh, Child Behavior Checklist. And uh, there's an item about obsession, and there's another item about compulsion. So for these two items, in general, they found um, males, boys and girls, basically, they're all child adolescents. Uh, compared to their siblings, their non-gender referred clinical um, controls, and also non-referred children, uh, they're all having higher obsessions and compulsions. I mean, for, for children with um, gender identity issues. Um, what is even more interesting is that um, there is more gender-related theme in terms of obsession in the gender dysphoric males compared to their siblings, but that's not found in the gender dysphoric females. But this is this uh, relation to gender-related themes also not found in um, for in terms of compulsion. So all these four studies suggest that uh, there are some initial evidences, at least from the clinical sample, and some of them from general population recruitment that if you try to, to, uh, to, to uh, define uh, autism by clinical criteria, there might be increased rate of autism spectrum disorder in the clinical sample. If we're trying to um, define autism characteristics by questionnaires, there might be also increased uh, traits of autism for individuals with gender dysphoria. What about the other side of the thing? Uh, looking at gender variant in autism spectrum condition, 
and there's the, 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 the studies are only like two that's published <laughs> to date and they're all published this year so it's just very initial evidences but in this study in the Swedish population uh, for adults with and without autism and comparing them to controls males and females they inquire two aspects one is about the gender variant, gender aspect and the other about sexuality so for the gender aspect both males and females with autism reported less masculinity traits by a questionnaire, which is a modified version of the band sex role inventory in the Swedish language. Um, they also found that there are more variant gender identity in individuals with autism, but that's only found for females with autism, but not males with autism. They also found more recalled, tomboyish um, presentation behavior characteristics in childhood from, from individuals with autism, from their, their recall. But that's also for female only. There is an increased um, um, the term they use is sissy presentation for males with autism um, reported by themselves. Um, the other relevant but not directly relevant aspect is about um, sexuality. So all for both males and females they found later sex, sexual debut, less sexual arousal interest and less inclination to initiate sex. And for females only they found more same sex and sexual attractions, but that's not found in males with autism. So for this study it suggests that Probably in autistic populations, um, in general, there might be increased um, variant in terms of gender identity, uh, but that's more prominent in the female population, females with autism, rather than males with autism in this study. <coughs> but in another study from for American sample, uh, it shows a slightly different message. So it's in child adolescent population with um, ASD and they also compare that with ADHD and also uh, medical neurodevelopmental conditions like epilepsy and neurofibromatosis. Uh, comparing to controls, they found that um, if they define gender dysphoria also by one item only on the child behavior checklist, which uh, item 110 is do I have the wishes, to, does the child have wishes to be the opposite sex? And uh, by this single item, they uh, noted that there's increased, re increased rate of gender dysphoria in ASD, 5.4%, with the odds ratio of 7.5, so 7 times, 7.5 uh, more likely that an individual uh, with ASD may have gender dysphoria compared to the control um, sample. But that's also true for ADHD, but not true for in children with epilepsy and neurofibromatosis. Um, but the, the gender dysphoric um, behavior occurs equally frequent in females and males. So compared to the earlier sample in adults, which showed that the gender variant is actually more prominent in the female population than male population with autism. In this sample, it actually is equally uh, likely that males and females with um, autism spectrum disorder, defined here, have increased rates of gender dysphoria. Uh, what they also found is that um, for individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, when they have gender dysphoria, they also have higher rates of anxiety and depression, which is interpreted as having a, a secondary result of gender dysphoria. But if one has ASD, the uh, associated emotional symptoms actually decreases. So the interpretation from all those is that probably the social, uh, the issues of social awareness, the lack of social awareness, the decrease of social awareness, is actually protects. Uh, uh, individuals who say having gender dysphoria from suffering from more emotional symptoms. So these are the data uh, suggesting that there might be increased rate, uh, increased co-occurrence between the two. But um, what are the implications from the two? Um, so this is an example from autism that um, coming from autism, autism is a new developmental condition that having high co-occurring rate with other conditions, no matter, no matter its medical or behavioral conditions. Uh, there are a range of um, possibilities. Some of them might be their shared physiological development mechanisms contributing to both. So for example, for a child with autism and heavy epilepsy, there might be underlying shared medical um, examina medical um, causal factors uh, explaining this. <coughs> Uh, but one may be a secondary consequence of the other. For example, adults with autism have higher rates of depression. And that might be because of the experiences growing up with the condition, so that leads to lots of sufferings from social interactions that leads up to the onset of depression. 
Uh, but for some current condition, it might be that there are some, some shared presentation and associated mechanisms. So the two conditions share something in common. For example, for obsessive compulsive disorder um, and autism, they might share the same behavior presentation, which also implies they have shared underlying um, mechanisms. Um, for the last uh, possible ex explanation is that they might because the high concurrence rate might be because of overlapping the diagnostic criteria. For example, for schizoid and obsessive compulsive personality disorders and autism, they share actually share similarities in terms of diagnostic criteria. So the high concurrence rate is actually because of the way we define them themselves. So what, what I what I want to say here is that when gender variant meets autism spectrum condition, uh, there might also be a range of possibilities to explain uh, why they occur together. Uh, they may have shared presentation and social mechanisms of the two. But I have to stress that from the DSM-5 criteria that they brought up at the very early, very beginning, there is nothing really, nothing <coughs> written in common that the two conditions, the two criteria are, are overlapping with each other. So uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be the case that it's overlapping diagnostic criteria. But there might be some shared presentation. For example, if uh, there's an intense cross-gender interest, and if that's high, if that's high enough to be uh, to be uh, to be part of the ASD, then that actually can be um, the reason that we found increased uh, prevalence, increased rate of the of co-occurrence between the two conditions. Um, but it could also be the case that one being the uh, president or cause of the other. So, for example, um, if an individual has um, autism spectrum condition and the the uh, intense, intense restricted interest is actually something presented as cross-gender behavior and, or even internalizing um, uh, aspects about one's identity, then that may present a uh, gender dysphoria. By, by reading the behavior. But if that's true, then one must recognize that uh, this individual with ASC does not only have uh, this high intensity of restric restricted interest, but they may also have uh, preceding social communication features of autism spectrum condition. The other possibility is that actually the cross-gender interest and social difficulty of an individual with gender dysphoria is shown as autism spectrum condition or autism spectrum condition like characteristics. But if that's going to be true, then the gender dysphoric presentation may uh, or must be precede the, the onset of the early uh, features of autism spectrum condition, which is probably not that likely to be the case for most of the individuals uh, with gender dysphoria, but it's still possible probably for some individuals with gender dysphoria. Um, what I think um, is most probable is that for the subset of individuals who are ha having both, not meaning that uh, this applies for the individuals with ASC without gender dysphoria or individuals with gender dysphoria or without ASC, but for those having things in common, they may share physiological and development mechanisms that's probably also related to sexual differentiation mechanisms happening early in life. Uh, probably genetic or prenatal factors. So there are some hypotheses that has been proposed uh, in the past, not directly related to, not initially intended to, to address issues about gender variant and autism, um, but they may, may apply to, to explain what's happening uh, here from the numbers that we observed here. So the first idea is actually proposed by Hans Hausberger himself, um, back in 1944, and sort of like being formalized by Professor Simon Baron Cohen um, about more than 10 years ago, that the, propose, the proposal is that autism is a form of extreme male brain. Uh, the idea of the extreme male brain is about cognitive characteristics or psychological level characteristics. Uh, the initial proposal says nothing about the physical aspects or the gender identity aspects or even the gender role characteristics characteristics of the individual. It's mainly about the uh, cognitive aspect of, the, um, of an individual. The idea is that um, 
uh, in average, not necessarily to everyone, but in average, there is a higher um, characteristics of so-called systemized interest to the physical world for males compared to females, um, biological. And in average, there is a higher characteristics of related to behavior presentations of empathy and social interaction for females to males. And that's a small difference, but there is still this. So the idea is that autism presents as itself as a, 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 a strengthened idea of higher uh, systemizing, so more interest to the non, uh, to the physical world, basically, and then a sort of like decreased propensity, interest, or ability to understand the social world. So that's why it's proposed as an extreme male brain. That idea has been sort of like extrapolated to to be tested in other levels, biological, psychological levels, and. Um, if we extrapolate that idea to gender variant, the idea should be that there will be more gender variant in females, but not the males. And that's sort of like what we found um, in the earlier studies. And there have also been um, tests on the physiology of individuals. So um, for finding a masculinized physiology across most males and females, and that's a prediction from, from, from this hypothesis. But that's only found in females with autism, but not males with autism. There are studies finding that females with autism may have higher, um, higher uh, levels of some of the uh, androgenic hormones in the body, and they found that uh, in their serum proteomics, uh, fingerprints characterizing autism, um, these hormone-related um, molecules are more related to females with autism, but not males with autism. And there's also one study published last year, two years ago actually, from the Swedish sample, examining physical features, anthropometric features, and uh, hormonal features, and they found that females with autism are actually having uh, features towards masculinized direction, but males with autism are actually having the other direction, which is towards feminized direction. I'll mention that later on. And one of our studies also mentioned there's a masculinized neuroanatomy, it's cross-sectional, nothing about pulse, uh, in females with autism, but not males with autism. So that's also not fitting the idea of extreme male brain predictions, which predicts that we should follow, we should find both um, uh, masculinized neuroanatomy in both males and females. And there's a, a, a proposal that this may be related to prenatal androgens, and there's one study that's in press finding that in boys with autism, uh, elevated levels of prenatal stereogenic hormones is related to um, the onset of autism later in, life, later in life, but that's only found in males. It hasn't been examined in females with autism. There's an alternative idea here proposed by the Swedish group. It's called reduced gender coherence in autism. And this is what I mentioned earlier. So basically, as you can see from the graph here, um, so uh, the round ones, that's representing males. For the squared dots, they're representing females. And all the dotted line um, there represents the, um, the, the basically the mean of the control. So the the, uh, the far, farther a dot is away from the line represents the, far, the more deviation from the mean of the controls. And the directions are um, for the left side it's more masculine, for the right side it's for more feminine. So what I found here is that for the female population, females with autism, they have some features showing masculinization, so more androgenic. But for males, it's actually the opposite direction. Um, and that's, this is also what we found for, um, for new anatomy. Um, it's a bit convoluted, but uh, let me try to explain it here. So we have four groups, um, which is males and females <coughs> control, MCAFC, males and females with autism and MNFA. If we compare their new anatomy, compare any two groups, it gives, gives you the characteristics of autism, for example. Compare MCNMA, we have a characteristics of autism representing in terms of neuroanatomy. If we compare MCNFC, male female control, let's assume that represents something called sexual dimorphism in the brain. So the idea is that if the extreme male brain prediction is true, then what we should down is that the two blue arrows and the two red arrows, which is the overlap between the sexual dimorphism and the 
presentation of autism in females, they should overlap to a substantial extent. We only found that for the red light, which is for the females with autism. So we found evidence suggesting that the characteristics of autism manifest in females in terms of neuroanatomy overlap substantially with the characteristics of the differences between control males and control females. But for, for, the, for males with autism, we actually found that the characteristics of autism manifest in terms of neuroanatomy overlaps with the characteristics of the brain representing the direction of female to male differences. So that's also like humanization. So the idea here is that the finding in the, in, in the brain actually fits somehow with the physical or anthropometric findings from the Swedish group. Sorry, I'm out of time, but <laughs> I'm uh, running to the last three slides about the interim summary of what's that here. So we found above trans intersection of the two spectrums of individual differences. We have to know that, we have to be aware that there's the majority of gender variant individuals do not have clinical level autism traits. The majority of individuals with autism do not have gender variant. But individuals having both may be a subgroup of autism and gender dysphoria that they share distinctly uh, underlying mechanisms. So the two spectrums are heterogeneous themselves. So it's probably that those having things in common, they share something in common. Um, and also, the natal sex actually matters. For probably gender variants and as well as autism spectrum condition. Although it's defined behaviorally, they might be quite different in biological males and biological females. And that, that's something we have to keep in mind. The last idea is actually cited from um, the Dutch group that there might be some clinical implications here. Uh, they describe then when, when, when they are um, discussing clinical issues with gender dysphoria adolescents, um, uh, the second bit, autism-related inflexibility is actually an issue when discussing how one should um, do the best adaptation in terms of the social, um, in terms of social interaction, um, dealing with the gender variant issues. So that's a difficulty here. But autism does not seem to affect the persistent versus desistance of gender dysphoria. Uh, and they suggest that it's important to disentangle how gender dysphoric uh, presentations evolve from simply feeling different <laughs> in relation to autism presentation, or it's actually more related to um, the core of gender identity. And uh, they also suggest that it's, it's kind of like an, an indirect uh, assumption, but since they found that most of the gender dysphoric Adolescents, adults with <coughs> autism, are ha are sexually attracted more, you know, on average, sexually attracted to their opposite natal sex. Then, whether um, they will have a similar level of satisfactory outcome in terms of going into biomedical procedures should be actually considered uh, more cautiously. And that's the, the um, summary from from this clinical paper. Sorry for running out of time, and uh, I hope this introduction is somewhat. Um, uh, meaningful to you, and I look forward to uh, questions and discussions. Thank you.